Thank you, Madam, and good morning. I think we all know that global warming is an important problem, one of the real crises of our time. And like most of you, I'm very worried about it. But I think the many inequalities that shape our daily lives, income inequality, wealth inequality, educational and career inequality, represent a much more immediate threat. Inequality's many pernicious impacts, along with enormous cultural differences, have driven us into political tribalism so severe that it threatens our ability to govern ourselves. The intensity of our disagreement raises the troubling question of whether we can find reconciliation before catastrophe strikes. I don't know the answer to that question, but I do think that catastrophe lies in wait. In their recent book, Why Nations Fail, Darren Asamiglu and James Robinson note that the main reason societies decline is, quote, domination by a narrow elite that have organized society for their own benefit at the expense of the vast mass of people. Louis Brandeis, who served on the Supreme Court from 1916 to 1939, made the same point when he wrote, quote, we must make our choice. We may have democracy, or we may have wealth concentrated in the hands of the few, but we cannot have both. Now, since we all want to avoid catastrophe, let's talk about how things became as they are about how extreme inequality has become, about the consequences of inequality, and about what we ought to do to set things right. My wife and I, who have been together for 62 years, <laughs> yeah, she's a great gal. <laughs> and we often discuss the many changes that we have seen in society since our growing up years. Back then, during the decades immediately following World War II, income inequality didn't feel like much of a problem. There were certainly both rich and poor, but hope was a vibrant reality everywhere as the world enjoyed the benefits of a rising economic tide. In the United States, most people trusted the government thought there were lots of opportunities to get ahead, and believed that their kids would do even better than they had done. None of that is true today. In the 1980s, Ronald Reagan famously posited that government isn't the solution, government is the problem. While we can all agree that government often blunders, it is a reality that only government can gather the resources needed to build the sinews of civilization. An adequate national defense, a robust national infrastructure, large-scale research and development, education for all, clean air, safe food, and on and on. Like it or not, our increasingly complex society makes each of us increasingly dependent on one another. The social contract that binds us together is based on the presumption that government can and will provide a satisfactory physical environment and an economic framework in which we will all have a fair shot at the American dream. When trust breaks down, as it has, it becomes impossible for government to formulate or implement plans to keep its part of the bargain. In the years following World War II, the United States enjoyed very rapid economic growth. Although the competing demands of returning service members and home front employees created some conflicts, President Truman's fair deal extended FDR's New Deal, and the concurrent recovery of many other world economies made it possible for the U.S. business community to restore peacetime production and raise the overall standard of living. Productivity and wages rose in tandem for many years. There were ample, well-paid manufacturing jobs available to non-college educated men and women. 
Large numbers of Americans finished high school, took a job, got married, had kids, and lived happily ever after. Middle incomes, middle class incomes, rose faster than incomes at the top, and income inequality decreased. Unhappily, in the 70s and the 80s, corporate America changed its mind about its mission. Business leaders decided that the goal of business ought to be maximizing shareholder value, which is shorthand for maximizing profits. In the years since, those leaders have fought for deregulation, have supported tax changes that helped the rich and penalized the middle class, opposed increasing the minimum wage, outsourced millions of jobs to low-cost international and domestic vendors, sought to decertify and obstruct labor unions, introduced mandatory arbitration and non-compete provisions in employment contracts, opposed antitrust enforcement, sought to minimize pension obligations by substituting defined contribution plans for defined benefit plans, and in the name of linking management rewards and shareholder returns, ushered in an era of vastly inflated senior executive compensation. The business community and our society as a whole have also embraced two really bad ideas. The first is that economic growth is more important than economic fairness. And the second is that lowering prices is more important than preserving jobs. Those actions shattered the bonds of loyalty and support between companies and their employees. And they embittered many employees who felt betrayed by the changing ground rules. They also broke the long-standing link between productivity and wages and drove a larger share of profits towards capital and a smaller share towards labor. At the same time, more intensive use of technology and more global labor markets intensified middle-class wage pressures, eroding the ability of non-college educated breadwinners to support a family. Meaningful and rewarding work is a source of both pride and satisfaction. And as good jobs became scarce, dissatisfaction displaced more positive feelings. As more women joined the workforce, seeking either job satisfaction or additional family income, home and community life diverged from the broad patterns of behavior that characterized the earliest post-war decades. As community capabilities atrophied, Government failed to focus on the need for institutional alternatives, which exacerbated the frustrations created by changing circumstances. The result is an economy that works well for the winners and very badly for the left behind. At a recent meeting of the American Economic Association, David Autor of MIT pointed out that the inflation-adjusted earnings of workers without a college education have risen very little in the last 50 years, and that the earnings of non-college graduate men have actually fallen. He went on to explain that the future of the left behinds is bleak, since most new jobs open to non-college graduates are what he called last mile jobs, offering low pay and little job satisfaction. So where have all the good jobs gone? Some, of course, have succumbed to the growing use of technology, which allows fewer people to produce more goods using better machines. But others have either been exported or outsourced in pursuit of the belief that maximizing profits and minimizing prices are more important than preserving good jobs. A couple of examples from the industry where I earned my keep are telling. At one time, there were far more airline mechanics in the United States than there are today. And aircraft were routinely repaired and overhauled in U.S. maintenance facilities. Then came 2002, an industry financial crisis and the beginning of major outsourcing in the airline industry. One of the things outsourced was heavy maintenance, 
which is the periodic deep overhaul of every aircraft. These days, such work is done in maintenance facilities located around the world by people who earn far less than the unionized mechanics who did the work before it was outsourced. Many of those mechanics work on aircraft owned or operated by U.S. airlines. Although I do not have exact numbers, a very substantial number of very high-skilled jobs that paid something like $60 an hour back in the 1990s are gone for no reason other than reducing costs. In my judgment, we would have struck a better balance between ticket prices and job preservation by requiring U.S. carriers to service their aircraft in the United States. Another example relates to jobs of a less skilled sort, the people who service aircraft and move bags and equipment around at each airport. The area where the planes are parked outside the terminal is known as the ramp, and the people involved are ramp workers of various types. These are very physical jobs some requiring considerable training and others requiring little except a strong back and a willingness to work hard. At one time, all of the ramp workers were airline or airport employees. Most were represented by unions, and all were well paid with comprehensive benefit packages. No more. As the industry was deregulated and as unions lost sway, more and more airlines were able to outsource ramp workers to third-party companies. Those companies pay as little as possible, offer minimum benefits, and are subject to periodic contract negotiations with the airlines. Since the third parties have no effective leverage, airlines will bid competitors against one another to reduce costs. When an airline replaces Company A with Company B, Company A has no choice but to lay off the people who are doing the work. Quite often, those people are rehired by Company B, often at a lower wage, to enable Company B to provide the lower costs the airline seeks. The airline gets lower costs every few years, but the jobs never get better. Similar practices are common in other industries, as are restrictions of various kinds intended to prevent workers from improving their lot by moving from one employer to another. It is hard to find a better job when you work for the only significant employer in the area. Think of a Walmart or an Amazon warehouse in a rural county. Absent a strong union, there's no one to push big employers to insist on higher wages or better benefits. And as a consequence, Life goes on, but progress stalls. If you work in fast food, there isn't much point in leaving your job if all the fast food outlets in the area offer the same pay rates. And it's frustrating to find a place that will pay a bit more only to learn that you can't work there because the document you signed when you got your present job says you can't work for the competition for 90 days after leaving. These are monopsony situations. That is, situations in which there is one or very few competitive buyers of labor. And there are lots more of them now than there were before the many acquisitions and mergers that have shaped America in the last two decades. Did you know that the number of publicly listed stocks has fallen from more than 7,000 in 1998 to just 3,600 in 2017. Did you know that Google, Amazon, Apple, and Facebook spent more than $31 billion buying 486 companies in the last 10 years? Did you, do you think the company is better off with fewer and fewer chief executives making all the economic decisions that shape our economy? If so, Permit me to disagree. Here is a stunning example of how much things have changed. Until the 1970s, productivity and wages grew at about the same rate. As a consequence, wage income increased and prosperity broadened. In 1979, the bottom 90% of the American workforce earned 58% of total U.S. personal income. 
In 2015, that share had dropped to 46.6%. Had the 1979 share been held constant, the bottom 90% of the workforce would have had additional 2015 income of about $11,000 per household, or about $1.35 trillion in total. Think about the impact of that much additional discretionary income. The discrepancies between those at the top of the economic heap and everyone else have become immense. In 1980, the average big company CEO earned just 42 times as much as the average U.S. worker. In 2017, that number had risen to 361 times as much as the average worker. In 2017, the average income of the top 1% in the United States was $1.3 million. And the average for the top one-tenth of 1% 1 was a breathtaking $7 million. The average for the bottom 90% was $35,709. Moreover, an estimated 43.5% 40, of the U.S. population, about 140 million people, were either poor or low income. And it keeps getting worse. Between 1979 and 2017, the incomes of the top 1% rose seven times faster than the incomes of those in the bottom 20%. Other numbers tell the same tale. In 1975, 25% of men 24, 25 to 34 years of age we're earning less than $30,2016. By 2016, 40 years later, things were worse. 41% of men in that age bracket earned less than $30,000. And finally, statistics say that only 5% of domestic workers in the United States are paid on the books, which means that most of my neighbors and yours are breaking the law and stealing the retirement security of the people who make their beds and do their dishes. What a shame. Wealth is even more highly concentrated than income. The richest 1% of Americans have more wealth than the bottom 90%, and the top 5% hold two-thirds of all wealth. The U.S. wealth concentration is now equal to that of the late 1920s the previous high point, and is more extreme than that of any Western European country, the United Kingdom, or Canada. These inequalities have many perverse impacts, all of which have made our skewed society less attractive. Unequal societies have higher crime rates, particularly in low-income areas. Unequal societies have higher levels of obesity, mental illness, homicides, teenage births, incarceration, drug use, and child abuse. Inequality diminishes social cohesion, which was very high in the U.S. in the 40s and 50s, and is very low today. Economic inequality gives wealthy groups and individuals enormous political advantages. In an economically <clears throat> unequal society, the society-wide average level of education decreases, while the number of educational elites increases. Unequal societies tend to underinvest in education, as the U.S. has been doing for many years. Income inequality drives both income and wealth towards high-income households who save more than low- and middle-income households. And that leads to less consumer spending and lower aggregate demand. These issues, higher crime, a lower level of public health, political inequality, inadequate education, and income inequality itself, combine to drive lower long-term growth rates than those enjoyed by more equal societies. The impact of these problems, together with conflicts and disagreements driven by widely differing cultural views has changed the optimism of the post-war years to the pessimistic view that a better tomorrow is unlikely. 
to rebuild a shared sense that tomorrow can and will be better, we need to focus on making changes that will improve people's lives immediately, while simultaneously persuading them that further improvements lie ahead. The immediate task should be creating jobs that pay enough to support a family and that are culturally satisfactory to middle-class men and women who regard production rather than service as appropriate work. To create those jobs now, while we work to fix longer-term problems, it is time to launch a major effort to rebuild our infrastructure, revitalize our national parks, and create the physical enhancements needed to deal with the impact of global warming. Hiring the people needed to do the work at appropriate wages will send a message of hope to those who have lost faith in the future, while simultaneously building things that we absolutely have to have. Beyond infrastructure, the jobs fix should include raising the federal minimum wage, which has not increased since 2009, from its presently absurd level of $7 and a quarter to $15, and indexing it to inflation for the years ahead. Raising the minimum wage and simultaneous, thank you. Raising the minimum wage and simultaneously expanding the earned income credit will have an enormous favorable impact on those who work in low wage, low benefit service jobs and who cannot, for whatever reason, join the effort to rebuild our physical infrastructure. We should also modify our laws to encourage unionization, particularly in service industries like healthcare, lodging, and food service, where wages have long lagged reality. In years past, a substantial share of America's workforce belonged to unions. Today, only about 6% are unionized. Our economy needs a better balance between employers and employees, and strong unions can help provide it. We should also outlaw non-compete agreements, as well as mandatory arbitration clauses, both of which tip the scales against employees. To attack the job problem in the longer term, we need a better educated public and that means better public schools, which means better paid teachers, better buildings. <laughs> Pre-kindergarten and kindergarten for every kid. And high quality daycare to fill in for families when both parents work. We also need much better balanced educational goals. Although we spend substantial amounts subsidizing college education, we spend very little on skills training. The modern world can't run efficiently without plumbers, electricians, <laughs> welders, pipe fitters, auto mechanics, and a thousand other useful trades. And we ought to do more to blend effective apprenticeship and training programs into our high school and community college curriculums. Finally, as noted earlier, we need to revitalize our enforcement of the antitrust laws. A very high percentage of mergers fall far short of the promises made when the documents are signed. The reality is that limiting competition is among the goals of every merger and is the primary goal of many. In my view, it is time to stop companies from combining, period. To do all those things, we need to give government more money and a new set of directions. As many in this audience know, many monetary theorists no longer believe that deficits matter. And if that is the case, we need not worry about spending what is needed to solve our problems. On the other hand, if we want to control deficits, we can certainly find more tax revenue, as many other countries already do. Total U.S. taxes take about 27% of GDP. The average of the OECD countries is 34.2%. The U.K. takes 33.3%, Germany 37.5%, and France 46.2%.
Moving the government's share up to just the OECD average would provide something like an additional $1.4 trillion annually to be spent for the public good. There are many sources that can be tapped. We should begin by closing several loopholes in the existing tax law, which include allowing fund managers to characterize their earnings as capital gains, allowing real estate investors to endlessly defer taxes on property gains, and allowing a step up in asset tax bases at debt. Having closed those loopholes, our next step should be adding whatever resources the IRS needs to fully enforce existing laws, thus collecting an estimated $400 billion annually while restoring integrity to our tax system. Research tells us that people care more about fairness than they do about inequality. And nothing could be more unfair than encouraging tax evasion by refusing to fund enforcement. Once we are collecting all of the taxes owed under current law, we can find whatever additional funds are needed by some mix of a federal carbon tax, increased gasoline taxes, applying payroll taxes to all earnings, and adding a value-added tax. And finally, we should reinstate higher estate tax levels. Passing down huge sums from one generation to the next flies in the face of the egalitarianism which lies at the heart of the American story, and it is enormously unfair. Moreover, an estate tax can provide substantial funds. Had we left the estate tax unchanged since 1972, it would have contributed $85 billion in 2015 alone, and more than that in each year since. We could do a lot for the common good with those additional dollars. Now, if all of this were to happen, if we were lucky enough to elect people willing to limit mergers, increase the minimum wage, fix the IRS, launch a truly major effort to fix our infrastructure and prepare for climate change, encourage unionization, implement a VAT and increase the estate tax, I think we would rekindle much of the hope and the good feeling that young people took for granted in the 1950s when I came to adulthood. Fixing our community in these ways would recreate the basis of the American dream a place where everyone willing to work hard can find a job which pays enough to support a family and which will also generate the pride, satisfaction, dignity, and respect we all want and need. To accomplish that goal, we all need to work hard on behalf of leaders who share our ideas and aspirations. While some will say these hopes are utopian, I think that unless we initiate change soon, we will likely face a future worse than most of us are willing to imagine. So let's resolve to do all we can, and let's hope that when this meeting convenes a decade hence, America will be a better and more optimistic place than it is today. Thank you for your attention.